Okay, so now we're going to talk about the transformation mask. And that's exactly what this did, is that it transformed the wearer during ceremony. So this is from the Kwak Waka Wak Native American tribes. And they're from the northwest coast of Canada. So you want to think kind of on the way to Alaska, as if you kept going up the five past Washington. And um, this dates from the late 19th century CE, and the materials are wood, paint, and string. And the transformation mask is from the background is the Northwest Coast Americas. And there was an unusually abundant amount of resources, particularly salmon. And the peoples of this region exploited the abundance to develop a complex and a distinctive way of life. They use a lot of animal imagery, and it's significant because clans would claim to descend from a mythical animal or an animal human ancestor from whom the family derived its name and the right to use certain animals and spirits as totemic, like a totem pole, like totemic emblems or crests. Emblems appear frequently in Northwest Coast art, notably in carved cedar house poles and the tall freestanding mortuary poles that are often erected to memorialize dead chiefs. Okay, so the mass backgrounds are supposed to, um, the purpose of them or the function is to call upon guardian spirits that made it many Native American cultures um, would do when they staged ritual dance ceremonies. So in the ceremonies, the dancers wore these elaborate costumes and then these striking and painted wooden masks. Among the most elaborate masks were those used by the Kwaka, sorry, Kwak Waka Wak in the winter ceremony that initiated members into the shamanistic Hamatsa society. The dance is reenacted, the taming of the Hamatsa, a cannibal spirit, and his three attendant bird spirits. They carve painted masks, but then transform the dancers into Hamatsa and the bird attendants and they would search for victims to eat. So if you notice the strings right here that you could see coming out of the eyes and then you can kind of see dangling back here, those strings are really important because they're able to um, allow the dancers to manipulate the mask so that the beaks would open and snap shut with spectacular effect. So the significance of this piece is not just obvious its artistic value, of the object but its use of the mask um, for effect in the dance and that's really important for performance art. So audience members would participate in the performance and in the early times of this um, of this performance they brought containers of blood so that when bird dancers attacked them they could appear to bleed or have flesh torn from them. They would have like all kinds of like attachments to them to really make this as, as realistic as possible. Whistles would happen behind a screen to announce the arrival of, a, of a, the Hamatsa, which was usually danced by the initiate, who enters through a central hole in the screen in a flesh car carving frenzy. Wearing hemlock, a symbol of the spirit world, he crouches and dances wildly with outstretched arms as the attendants try to control him. He disappears and then returns wearing red cedar dancing upright. Finally tamed a full member of the society, he would then come back and then dance with women. The attendants crack open skulls with the beak of their performance and then eat the brains of the victims. So snapping their beaks, these masters of illusion would enter the room backward with the mask pointed up as though the birds are looking skyward. Then they would move slowly and counterclockwise around the floor. And at each change in the music, they crouch, snap their beaks, and let out wild cries of hap, hap, hap. <laughs> These wooden masks are operated by the strings worked by the dancers. Uh, so these are really unique, but what was unfortunate is that the Canadian government um, encouraged by Christian missionaries, they outlawed the winter ceremony in 1885, claiming they claimed that the ritual was injurious, encouraged um, prostitution, endangered children's education, 
It damaged the economy and apparently encouraged cannibalism. Uh, so despite the ban, the Kwok Waka Wok refused to um, abide by it. And by 1936, the government and missionaries essentially gave up trying to enforce the, the ban, but they, they still weren't allowed to openly practice the ceremony in public until 1951. Uh, today, the winter ceremony does still happen um, in this region in Canada, but we um, have some of the masks uh, in museums, obviously. And I took a picture of a few of the different masks that they have at the Met. So here's one of them that's in the Met that um, you could see the hemp up here and you could see the, how it's made of wood and there's the strings. See that the mouth would have opened, see more strings back here. And so that would have been on the dancer's head. And then just to kind of give you an idea of size, it's, you know, obviously a selfie, so hard to get per true perspective, but obviously this would fit on my head. But now if you look at this picture, you can look, I mean, it's not a super great shot because of the glare, but if you can see, you can see the eyes right here of a human, even a mustache. You could see the mouth. Um, there's detail here on the wood. And then you could see more, um, you know, more art up here on the open part of the mask. And here are the strings. So you can see how the strings would have been manipulated as it snapped shut um, during the dance. And then here's that same one that I was just pointing to. Um, this is a whale. And so this is still the Kwok Wok Wok people, but this is a whale mask. So that would have been the mask from the um, ancestor that they identified themselves with. Um, you can see they have several masks in the Met because there's the one, the first book picture I took right there. So uh, they have uh, several of these in the Native American section or the indigenous section at the Met. So, okay, so that is the Kwok Wok Wok. Transformation mask. And yes, I just like to say it. <laughs>